Good morning, church. Wow. And we are getting to that point. What he just talked about in Revelation song, I cannot wait for the next two or three weeks as it just goes up, 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 and it is going to be so awesome. Today we start Endgame. Now, a little birdie has told me that apparently there's a movie, kind of a big deal, that came out this weekend. It's supposed to be the highest grossing movie of all time, anticipated to earn a billion dollars in the first five days. A bill, not a million, billion, one billion dollars, right? This is, this is, and, and I don't know why they synced it up. I think they knew I was going to preach on this today, and they decided to roll out the movie to piggyback off of this, or, or either that or they stole my title, but I don't think Captain America would do that. So what we're going to do today, I'm, just a spoiler alert, by the way, if you haven't seen it, uh, Yoda and Gandalf are half-brothers, and Dumbledore kills Captain Kirk. Just wanted you to know that. So now we can, we can just get it out in the open. Everyone is interested in the end game. Everyone wants to know what's going to happen. And what's the order? And what, and y'all, there's so many things that you can say about this. There's a thousand different opinions. And I once heard a story about an older lady who was attending a Baptist church. And he was preaching on the end game. And he came up. She, she, she came up. This, this poor Baptist preacher just poured his heart out into the pulpit. And she comes hobbling up to him. First words out of her mouth, I don't like you. <laughs> I don't like what you just preached. Like, Ma'am, I'm, I'm so sorry. She said, no, I, it's, you are so narrow-minded. It's almost like you honestly believe the words in that book. <laughs> How can you be so narrow-minded? She says, ma'am, I am so sorry. She interrupted him again and says, how can you be that narrow-minded? It's like you believe only you Baptists are going to heaven. He said, well, ma'am, I hate to disappoint you. We're even more narrow-minded than that. I don't even believe all us Baptists are going to make it. It's a... Uh, <laughs> Who's going? Who's going and who's not? When and how will it all happen? How will the end time events transpire? The Bible is God's record of redemption and reconciliation. The fall of man and then him writing himself into the story to bring us back. Genesis records the beginning. Revelation marks the end before we go to the eternal state. Y'all, it's going to be so awesome. So incredible. Words are so inept to conjure up kind of what we were singing about and how amazing it is going to be for those who know the Lord. And the invitation is for everybody. Hear me say that. This is, this is kind of an exclusive club that's open to all. You just have to RSVP. You just have to be on this. If you have a Bible and you've ever noticed the red letters, the very last red letters in all of the Bible is this beautiful verse here. Jesus says, surely I am coming soon. And if you're a believer, your heart echoes, amen. Come, Lord Jesus, come. We look around, we see such a broken world where churches are getting bombed and synagogues are having shootings. And what used to be considered sacred is now just open season. And it is, if you can't look with open eyes and see that the world needs a savior, man, it is so obvious. The signs seem to be everywhere. So today, as we start a new series, I'm going to give us an overview of the end game. It's going to go for several weeks. Today is going to be the hardest one because we have to have this launching point. And when you know where we're going with this, you'll understand. Oh, okay, I understand. So before we get going, I'm going to issue a friendly disclaimer. Okay? This is very important to me because I know many good people have different opinions on this. Many good people can and do differ on end time events. And that's okay. I have good pastor friends of mine who don't necessarily agree with each other. You know several well-known Bible scholars. If I named them, you would go, oh, they don't agree with each other? And that's okay. It happens. You know the story. You get two Christians in a room, you will come out with three opinions. That's just the way it is. People have differing opinions. So here's it. It doesn't make you bad. It doesn't make me bad or you a heretic or me a heretic on this. Just don't send me hate mail. Just don't do that. Psalm 133 is going to be our guiding verse. How beautiful, how good and pleasant it is when brothers dwell together and unity. All right, so this is going to be our, our guiding verse. St. Augustine is often credited with this. He says, in the essentials of our faith, we must have unity. There's no room for compromise there. But in the non-essentials of our faith, we can have liberty and give grace. But in all things, we must, must, must show charity. We must show love. So hopefully you can do it. And if you can play by the game rules, if you can do that, then welcome. You're in the right place, in the right series. But if you can't play by these rules... Might I dismiss you early to lunch? 
You can go beat the Methodists or the Presbyterians to the feeding trough, get in line, because today we are going to be a safe place where we can dive into the deep truths of Scripture. There's a lot of pastors who don't even touch these topics anymore because it seems that there's so much confusion. But if we can agree on the central truth before we even get going, namely, Jesus is Lord. He is coming again. He really lived. He really was the sinless son of God. He really died. He really was buried. He really rose victorious from the grave. And he is coming back. That is the core tenets of our faith. And I hope you believe that. It's not a mystery in that sense. There's no ambiguity. He is the way. He is the truth. And he is the life. And that's what we believe at the potter's hand. So I hope you understand that. There are so many verses of scripture that address the topic of end time events. Every single one of them centers around Jesus coming back, and rightfully so. The question is, when and how does he do it? We're not going to put timelines on. We're going to get goofy here. So he's coming next Thursday at midnight. No, I'm not doing that. Scripture says don't do that. Okay, so we're not going to do that. But we have these verses. And I want you to just, I'm just going to read a few to you. Out of John 14, let not your heart be troubled. Do you believe in God? Believe in me also, Jesus said. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go and prepare a place for you. Here it is. If I go and prepare a place for you, then that means I will come again and I will receive you to myself so that where I am, you may be also. Then we see the parables of the diligent servants in Luke 19 where the servants are looking. They're anxiously awaiting. They're anticipating the return of the king. Then we have the passages where Paul tells us the day of the Lord is coming as a thief in the night. Therefore, do not sleep, but be vigilant. Let us watch and be sober. All the way over in Hebrews chapter 9, we see this. It is appointed for men once to die, and after this comes the judgment. No one will escape it. To those who are eagerly waiting and looking for him to appear a second time, he will come, apart from sin, for salvation. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, he talks about this mysterious transformation. He says, behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment. In the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised, incorruptible, and we shall all be changed. Given glorified, resurrected bodies. This is, this is good news, especially if you woke up this morning and you're sneezing and you're aching and you're hurting and you, you are so ready for that mortal flesh to put on immortality. Is it just me? Am I the only one? Okay, all right, some of you are with me on that. But probably the most famous passage is the one we're going to look at today. And this is the one that seems to have the most controversy and the most confusion about it, and it's in Thessalonians. You can turn there if you want, but don't read it yet. Hold your place because I want to share the historical context because you've got to know why did Paul write this. The early church was hurting. I mean, big time. Over in Thessalonica, Paul shows up and he's like, what is going on? See, people were starting to face persecution. And their loved ones were starting to be murdered and persecuted for the faith. And several were dying, and they were under the impression that Jesus is going to come back and get us, probably in their lifetime. So now that Betty has died, and Uncle Joe has died, and Cousin Eddie has died, what do we do? Because what happened to them? They fell asleep in the Lord. Is it, did we miss it? And they started asking legitimate questions to Paul. And they were peppering them with questions. What if we die before Christ comes back? What do we do about these relatives that have died? I thought you said he was coming back. Do we have any hope? Will we see each other again? Tell us, Paul, please. Somebody tell us. So Paul says, all right, all right, time out. I'm going to write you two epistles here. I'm going to write two letters written about, we think, about six months apart. And they are incredible letters because he says, you guys need some comfort, and you need some encouragement, and you need some doctrine. Remember, they didn't have the New Testament. We do. We look at it and go, are you goofy? It's right there. How do you not know this? They didn't have that yet. So Paul swoops in, and thankfully, he writes two letters that are known as his eschatological epistles. That's just a fancy term, by the way, for end-time letters. And it's here that he goes into more detail than any of his other letters. And he reveals some mysteries, things to this point that were not even hinted at in the Old Testament. Some brand new revelation that Paul comes, and he reminds us why the second coming is so important. Not only to encourage that church and those struggling people who are being persecuted, but to give us, 2,000 years later, encouragement today to live obedient and holy lives so that when people see us, they see Christ. 
And they know we're different because we don't live just like everybody else. We don't grieve as those who have no hope. I spent seven days in the hospital this past week with mom. And y'all, you could see those who were grieving who had no hope. And you could see those who had that inner divine salvation. And it is night and day. And it is so real. I call this end game, but it is not a game at all. So Paul swoops in and he writes these two letters. So with that as our context, open your Bibles. First Thessalonians chapter 4. While you pull that up, let me welcome our online guests, our first time visitor. Great to have you with us as well. If you're reading on a digital app, I'm going to read from the CSB today, the Christian Standard Bible. Love that translation. And we're going to start in verse 13. Everybody got it? Here we go. We do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, sisters, concerning those who are asleep. Remember that term. We'll come back to that. So that you will not grieve like the rest who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, in the same way, through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. Verse 15. For we say this to you by a word from the Lord. Okay, he's saying where he gets his authority, his, his revelation from. We who are still alive at the Lord's coming will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. He's trying to give them comfort. Okay, don't worry about your, your dead relatives. Okay, they're, they're, they haven't missed it. Verse 16. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the archangel's voice, and with the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first, then... We, who are still alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, so we will always be with the Lord. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. So there it is. There's his encouragement. He's trying to lay it out. Now, when I'm doing my research, I love, 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 love to read multiple translations. And this week, the message doesn't disappoint. So if you flip over to that, look at the MSG translation. This is, this is classic. And regarding the question, friends, that has come up about what happens to those already dead and buried, we don't want you in the dark any longer. First off, you must not carry on over them like people who have nothing to look forward to, as if the grave were the last word. Since Jesus died and broke loose from the grave, God will most certainly bring back to life those who died in Jesus. And then there's this. We can tell you with complete confidence we have the master's word on it, that when the master comes again to get us, those of us who are still alive will not get a jump on the dead and leave them behind. In actual fact, they'll be ahead of us. The master himself will give the command. Archangel thunder. <laughs> Sorry, I can't help it. Does that not just make anyone else think about a wrestler? Like entering a ring? Like, and now, Archangel thunder, thunder, Sunday. So I just, I can't help it. I just, that's, maybe I'm just weird, but... Archangel thunder, God's trumpet blast. He'll come down from heaven and the dead in Christ will rise. They'll go first. Then the rest of us who are still alive at that time will be caught up with them into the clouds to meet the master. Oh, we'll be walking on air. And then there will be one huge family reunion with the master. Oh, I'm looking forward to that. So reassure one another with these words. So last week was Easter. And we looked at the resurrection of Jesus, and rightfully so. Because that, how he was resurrected, gives us a foretaste of how we will also be resurrected. About how our glorified bodies are coming. And Paul is talking about those who have already fallen asleep. Y'all, that is a term that was very common. It's a metaphorical reference to those who have died. And he's saying, just as a sleeping person expects to rise in the morning, those of us who fall asleep in the Lord can not expect to rise in that great getting up morning. We can go, and we will be forever with the Lord. Now, I want to clarify something here, because a lot of times people misinterpret that scripture. This is not a reference that when you die, you go into the ground, and you have some kind of purgatory system, or you have some kind of soul sleep, or you just kind of linger in the ether. Second Corinthians is very clear. He says, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. You don't hang around here trapped on earth. You don't haunt your loved ones. You don't come and move candles around and give people signs or do wee -hoo -wee -hoo, like that. It's none of that. You're with the Lord, and you want to be. When we die, our body goes into the grave, but our soul and our spirit, that nephesh, that goes. That's who you really are, by the way, right? We're, we're not a, a, a spirit and soul that happens to have a body. We're, we're the body. We have a spirit and soul, and that is who we are. And we go to be immediately with the Lord in his presence in what we call heaven. All right. So the question is, 
How and when do we go? And when does Jesus return? And here's where the confusion comes and the controversy. Inevitably, anytime you bring up that passage in Thessalonians, everyone brings up one word. Rapture. The rapture. And that word has so much baggage attached to it. And there's so many plausible theories and philosophies about how and when this great catching away can and happen and what does it actually mean. I personally don't use that word very often because of that confusion, because of that chaos. It, the word rapture gets a bad rap. So, no, Okay, all right, all right just, just, I'm just making sure you're with me, all right? As I was preparing this, I did what every great pastor does when they look for where the culture is with words like that. Because I grew up kind of in the church, and I grew up seeing these great, mediocre, low-budget movies about the end of times and people disappearing and their clothes laying on the ground, and Kirk Cameron's my hero just like he's yours, and all these great movies and stuff. But what does the culture think? So I Googled it, right? That's what we all do. I go, actually, you bing it, because I don't want to support Google. So I binged it, right? And I pulled up, the very first thing that came was an image that reveals what the modern day secular society feels about the rapture. And the rapture cat says, later heathens, I'm out. Here we go. It's that great, it's, it, you can just see the cat's face, right? He's like, I'm out, <laughs> deal with it. Then I noticed a theme, it's not just cats. It's also bears, apparently, <laughs> that, are, that are going in the rapture. You see that, and I'm starting to notice a theme, and, and don't worry all you dinosaur lovers, they didn't leave you out. There is also the well-known Velociraptor. So you can, uh, you can work that. And that right there reveals all you need to know about what the culture thinks of such a confusing term. And one of the reasons I don't like that term is because it's not actually in the scriptures. It actually comes from a Latin word, rapturo, which is really an off translation of the original Greek word, which is the one I like to go with, which is harpazo. It's a fantastic word. It literally means to be caught up or to be snatched away as if by force as if with great speed, sudden and unexpected. In fact, Paul uses it three times, and in this case, he's, it's coming almost like a thief in the night, which is probably why he uses it later to describe the Lord's return as coming like a thief in the night, because it implies sneaking up and suddenly snatching something from somebody unaware. Well, that puts a big difference than the Velocirapture we just saw and what would people see in, in all these confusing terms in Acts 8.39, Paul uses this word again, and he's talking about when the Spirit snatched up Philip and literally physically transported him to another location. That is a snatching. And we see that again when Paul is caught up into the third heaven over in 2 Corinthians, where he gets a sneak peek at paradise. So he sees more than anyone has ever been allowed to see. So the idea that Paul is conveying here is the return of Christ for his church evidently is very sudden because he uses the word harpazo. Those who are still alive are caught up in the clouds and are changed in a moment from mortal to immortal. Paul is saying this being caught up, this snatched away will happen in the twinkling of an eye with the other saints. Wherever he goes, we go. We will be with him never to leave his presence again. So the question is this, why? What is the purpose of Paul writing about this catching away? Well, I went to one of my heroes of the faith. I looked at what Dr. David Jeremiah had to say. And he put it this way. He said, the purpose of this harpazo, the purpose of this rapture, the purpose of the great catching away is to remove the church from condemnation. Is to remove the church before the judgment of God is poured out full strength during the seven years of tribulation. And then he cites this verse. He says, Christ told this to the church in Philadelphia. He says, because you have kept my command to persevere, I will also keep you from the hour of trial, which shall come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. And he goes on to say, when he discusses the judgments in the day of the Lord, that Paul says, none of these things will happen until he who now restrains the man of lawless, the lawless one, is removed. Okay, the lawless one, probably a reference to the coming Antichrist and, and the false prophet and all that. He who now restrains the lawless one is taken out of the way. A lot of theologians say that that's the Holy Spirit that is now restraining that for a time. But once that is taken away, now here's the thing. Where's the Holy Spirit in the modern church age? It's in us. It's in the church. We are being indwelt and sealed for the day of redemption. The Holy Spirit lives in us. In the Old Testament, right, the Holy Spirit came from a time and lighted on people and then, the comfort and then left. But in the New Testament, the Holy Spirit lives in us. We are the church. We are the bride of Christ, what Jesus is coming back for. So he's saying the righteous presence of the Spirit on earth, working through you, through the church, 
is what is holding back this flood of evil. And when that is taken away, the tribulation begins and it is unprecedented destruction and chaos. And we're going to look at that big time in the, in the weeks to come. But this will be a period that if these days weren't shortened, no flesh would survive. And consistent with that promise, John has a vision of the great tribulation and revelation where the church isn't mentioned again after chapter 3. Now why is that? Where did we go? If we believe that the great catching away happens and the church is absent from the earth, that obviously opens the door for the reign of the Antichrist to come, and John calls him the beast during this tribulation. So think about this. Picture what the world would be like with the church gone and the Holy Spirit, the holy antiseptic that we are, is removed. Wickedness would be able to run absolutely rampant. Right now, the world has us, God's ambassadors, the best we can. Even though we're flawed and we blow it many times, we are holding back the stem of corruption as best as believers do. We claim to be perfect, negatory. But imagine if we were gone. He is saying that when the Antichrist comes, that holy antiseptic is gone, that church, that, that, that salt and light will be taken out of the world and then the world will be free to reap the consequences of their full sinful desires and wickedness will have no body to say stop. No restraint. You picture it? You can think it's bad now? Just wait till God's spirit is removed and his wrath and his bowls of judgment are poured out full strength on those who have rejected his son. So we have these seven years of tribulation, intense trials. John then sees Christ coming again after the tribulation all the way over in Revelation 19 but this time it says Christ returns accompanied by the armies of heaven who are clothed in fine white linen pure and clean a reference to the church to the believers who are with the bride with the bridegroom who are arrayed in fine linen we're seen coming back with him so the question that people have asked is this is catching away in the second coming of Christ the same thing or not and that's where the confusion comes, because there are some great philosophies out there, some differing opinions. And it depends on who you ask, what answer you get. It depends on how you define the second coming. There's four main theories, and you can look at these. And I have great friends who believe in each one of these. So if this is you, and if you've been taught something different, or you've been to seminary, and you've got your doctorate in this, and you feel different, that's okay. You're allowed to be wrong. You can look up here, and <laughs> you got the blue box. You've got the, the red box and the postal and the amillennialism. It's just, it's all symbolic. I've got good friends who fall in each one of those camps. And I could put them on a debate team, and they could almost convince any one of us that it's accurate, okay? So all kidding aside, hear me say that. What's important to me is you know Jesus is coming back. We don't get bogged down into the when, okay? We know he's coming, and we need to be living holy and righteous lives, eager to share the gospel, the good news with people, knowing that every one of these ends with a judgment. It's just when is it going to happen? Now, most of the scholars that I look up to, the ones that I've been researching and look up to, tend to fall in that red box. These are scholars that some of my seminary friends, David Jeremiah, Billy Graham, uh, John MacArthur, even old school preachers like J. Vernon McGee, uh, Dwight Pentecost, even Hal Lindsey, tend to fall in that camp. And there's several reasons why, and we'll just touch a little bit some of them have tried to make it easier by showing it in chart form like this. If you just want to see the black and white. And they've pictured the second coming being an event that happens in two phases. I understand where this chart's going, but to me that's a little confusing. So if it helps, this is a different chart that actually puts some scripture to it. And it uses the R word, which again, I'm not a fan of because of the baggage that comes with it. But I want you to notice the difference between 1 Thessalonians 4.17 and Revelation 19. Because there are some key things that are very odd when you truly break them down and look at this. The end game here, the, the reason so many people in the modern evangelical church feel that this is a likely pattern is because there are some events that are mentioned after the catching away. And we've got to find a place to have these events. Key events, like the judgment seat of Christ, the Bema seat, where we go to be rewarded. That's for believers. That's not the great white throne judgment. That happens at the end. But the Bema seat, where we go to be with the Lord, our works are burned up, all the good ones are rewarded, the bad ones are washed away, and we are rewarded at the Bema seat. When does that happen? There's also the marriage supper of the Lamb that's talked about. When does that happen? If those things happen at the same time, that's why a lot of people seem to, seem to have a, 
a difficulty reconciling these things because if you are raptured for the church here, and that's also the second coming of Christ when we know his feet touched down at the Mount of Olives and it splits in two and he establishes his reign and his rule that was promised on the throne of David. If it all happens at the same time, then according to Paul, Jesus shows up and says, here I am, come up, meet together with the clouds in the air, all the saints, I bring them up. And then as we're going up, we're like, he's here, we're so excited. He goes, no, 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 I'm sorry, turn around, we're going back down, we're going back down, we go down. And it's this great U-turn. And it seems really odd that... Where do we have the marriage supper of the Lamb then, if we come straight back down? Where do we have the judgment seat of Christ? Because that doesn't indicate it happens on earth. It indicates that there is something happening. So here's, here's what happens. And this is probably the main reason that I hear the most of why there is a seven-year tribulation where great things are happening to you, the bride of Christ, in glory, and all heck is breaking loose during seven years on earth. Okay, And it comes down to one verse that I hear Paul has written, and, and David Jeremiah loves this verse. It's Romans 8.1. Read it with me. It says, therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Now, this is fantastic news. What he's saying here, embrace yourself. I want to go different. It, it, very, very deep. All in Romans, which is an awesome, tough, powerful book. In Romans 5, 6, and 7, Paul is saying judgment and wrath have been poured out on Jesus on the cross. All judgment, all of God's, the righteous, the Father's anger is hurled on the cross. Our sin, everything is put on him. That is the judgment day. So if you accept what happens at Calvary, that atoning death, that substitutionary death in your place, if you accept that on the cross, then your judgment day is behind you. That is good news. But for the unbeliever, your judgment day is still ahead of you. Your judgment day happens at the great white throne judgment. It's two different things. He's saying if all the condemnation of the Father is poured out on Calvary, then that is your judgment day. So the scholars are saying when he says there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, then how and why would we be left here to endure tons of condemnation and tons of tribulation and struggles and trials? And so David Jeremiah, when he quoted that verse, he's like, I don't understand how you could be left to receive full condemnation from a loving Heavenly Father who said, when you're in Jesus and you're in Christ, there is no more condemnation. So it's an interesting thing, and I just wanted to share a tiny bit about that. Some of the differences between the catching away in Scripture and the return of Christ are key. The first one I've noticed is the great catching away seems to happen in the air. While the actual return of Christ, his feet touch the ground at the Mount of Olives. They're separated by several books and scriptures. But there's a key instance. One, Jesus returns to the air in Thessalonians. In Revelation 19, Jesus doesn't stay in the air. He literally returns to earth. And for, in 1 Thessalonians, Jesus returns and is described in secret like a thief. But in Revelation, that is not how he's described at all. He is described coming openly and every eye sees him on that day. And those who don't know the Lord will weep and mourn because judgment has come. In the, in the first Thessalonians passage, Jesus returns for his church. But in Revelation 19, Jesus returns with his church. That is hugely different. We're seen with him in the vision coming behind him wearing white. We don't even have to fight because he comes on a white horse in that one. There's no white horse mentioned in first Thessalonians. It's not there. He's standing there appearing with the archangel thunder. First one, he's a bridegroom, and the next one, he comes as a conquering, victorious king. The first Thessalonians passage indicates it can happen harpazo, snatched away, in an instant, like a thief in the night. But that's not how Revelation 19, the return of Christ, is portrayed. There are so many signs that have to occur first. Matthew 24 and 25 describe all these things that have to happen. But this, this catching away can happen at any moment. That's why we're told, live right. Be looking up. He could come. In the twinkling of an eye, you could be summoned. And here's something people don't realize, but when the church, if the church is removed this way, the devil continues his evil reign because the false prophet and the Antichrist come on the scene then. That doesn't happen in Revelation 19. It doesn't happen at all. The devil is cast into the abyss, and he's locked away for a thousand years. So again, good people can and do differ on the order and the meaning of that, and that's okay, as long as we are in agreement on the core tenets. Jesus is coming again, and our lives better reflect that. We have to live holy and righteous lives, and we have to agree that Jesus really is the sinless Son of God. 
He really died. He really raised from the dead. And his atoning substitutionary sacrifice on the cross is the only way for the removal of sins. You can't earn it. You can't work for it. You can't be good enough. It is a gift that he provided. And I hope that any study, as we look at this end game, motivates all of us to holy living. Because it should. It should light a fire. When we were singing that third song today, it was all I could do to keep my contacts from rolling off my eyeballs with tears because I picture the flashes of lightning and thunder and the rainbows and all the incredible things that, that John does his best to describe. As we leave Thessalonians behind and we dive into this Revelation series, and you see the catching away has happened, and there are several key events that take place. Some of them you're going to love if you're a Christian, like the marriage supper of the Lamb, the Bema Seat, the rewards, being reunited with your family members who know the Lord. But there is some sobering and painful stuff that is happening to those who reject Christ. I can't put it any clearer. It is going to be hell on earth. The tribulation, these seven years, the first half, the first 42 months divided as, uh, eh, it's supposed to be a tribulation. It's going to be rough, persecution, beheadings. But that last three and a half years is going to be like something never seen before. And that's where we read all those things of the false prophet and the Antichrist and the Mark of the Beast and the Battle of Gog and Magog and Russia and China and all these supposed coalitions coming in. And then it all seems to wind up towards the great battle of Armageddon. See, these are terms you have heard all your life. What about these bowls and these plagues and all these things and this righteous wrath being poured out? We get to walk through that, and I hope you don't miss it. But more importantly than that, I hope you understand the need to know Christ. I want to share with you just a short story that illustrates this beautifully. Last week, I heard my friend Kermit Summerall. That's his real name, Kermit. And he was preaching in Colorado. And he shared a story about this guy right here who I'd never heard of. His name is Paul Grinberg. And he is a wealthy finance executive. But he got tired of that. And so he decided to become a food critic. Tour the world eating food. Anybody want that job? And he signed me up, Louise says. Can you imagine? He had a bucket list goal. His goal was to go and find the top 100 restaurants in the world. Go to them, make a reservation, fly to wherever they are, eat their best delicacies, and then write a review of them and give them publicity. So he flew all over the world. He was so fired up. One by one, he would find them. Then he'd make a reservation. He would fly out to wherever it was, give his review, cross it off his list, and move on to the next reservation. And he ate some crazy stuff, like shark belly, alligator tendon, mmm, brains, just nasty stuff. I don't understand what he's doing. And he flew all over the world, and he was crossing them off one after the other. And this took him, he's been doing this since 2011. And he got a picture of this guy right here. Here he is with 92 of the restaurants down with eight to go. Then there was a photo of him taken with 96 of the restaurants down with only four to go. Last year, the Wall Street Journal reported that he had been caught in a place with a poster showing that he had now knocked off 99 of his top 100 restaurants in the world. He accepted an invitation to Singapore and he came and the rest is history, leaving only one to go. And then it happened. He stalled. His bucket list, all the money in the world at his fingertips, he couldn't get to this last restaurant. There was one out there that eluded him. He just couldn't get into it. You know where it was? Apex, North Carolina. No, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. <laughs> it was in Tokyo, Japan, a little sushi place called Sushi Saito. This restaurant, are you ready for this? Only has eight seats. Talk about ultra exclusive. Now here's the deal. Everybody in Japan wants to go there. They have eight seats. They don't have a website. They don't take walk-ins. They don't advertise. They don't even answer their phone except one day a month. And if you happen to be lucky enough to catch somebody to answer the phone for the three or four minutes before it's booked for the next month, then you might have a shot. Might. There's an asterisk by this for a reason. So he's calling, and he's calling, and he's calling, and he's got all 99 done. This is the only one holding him back 
with all his connections throughout the world. Finally, somebody answers the phone at Sushi Saito, and he's so excited. He says, you don't know who I am. I'm Paul Grinberg. You may have read about me, but I'm, I'm famous now, and I'm going all over the world. I've looked at every restaurant. You are number one, the last one on my list, and I can't wait, and I just need to get on your reservation list so I can come. I don't care when it is. Just tell me. And they said, no, thank you, and hung up. <laughs> he was denied. Paul Grinberg, the guy who's now world famous, they declined his reservation. And he said he was stunned. He was so, he couldn't believe this. He hangs up the phone and he says, okay, I have no other choice. I didn't want to do this, but I'm going to call in my favors. All these billionaire executives that I have helped make wealthy over the years, all of these CEOs and presidents of companies and Fortune 5, and if I named them, you would know them. He withheld the names, and he, he said, I called every single one. I even called the president of a famous Japanese automaker that you would know, and not one of them could get him into this last restaurant. Not one. And then he learned the reason why he couldn't get in. Sushi Saito is an exclusive members only restaurant. You have to be a member before they even think of answering the phone. You can't just walk in. You can't even be recommended. You have to be brought by somebody who has one of those eight seats. You have to be invited. Here is a guy who is world famous, has all the money, all the credentials, all the connections, and none of it does him any good. None of it matters because he isn't a member. See where this is going? None of this matters because he didn't know the owner personally and have that relationship that translated into membership. Think how this applies to your spiritual life. Are you a member of God's family? It's a yes or no question. Is your name on the reservation list? Is your name written in the Lamb's Book of Life? It's not about good works. It's not about believing in God. The demons believe in God. And they tremble. But they don't have a saving knowledge. They didn't repent of their sin. They can anyway, but they didn't repent like this. Jesus said in Matthew 7, not everyone who says, Lord, Lord, is going to enter my kingdom. That's not enough. That's not what it's about. Anyone can call him and recognize him as Lord. And they say, hey, we did great things in your name. We cast out demons, didn't we? And Jesus looked at me and says, depart from me. I never knew you. I didn't have that membership knowledge. Today you are being invited to be a part of God's family. This end game is so awesome and totally different for those who are in the family, for those who have accepted what he's done. But if you reject God's escape hatch to what he gave the Lord Jesus, all of our wrath, all of our anger, and he said, I'll take this, and you reject that? Don't do that. Accept this invitation. And that's the good news, because you know I always bring the good news. You can join his family today. I did. Almost everybody I'm looking at in this room, I think at one point has. But if it's you that's here, or maybe you're driving in your car, or you're watching at home, don't pass this up. The end game is not a game. It's real. And we have got to make sure we are ready when the Lord comes back. Let's pray about it right now. Would you bow with me? God, I thank you that in the quiet of this moment, you speak to our heart. Your word just never returns void. There's so much power and truth, and it's everything we need to hear. So, Lord, I pray that anyone in the sound of this message, of this voice, would confess, just as I have, and just as millions of others have, confess our sin before you, that we have missed the mark. And Lord, we agree with you in what you say about our sin, that it has separated us from you, a holy God. Lord, we repent of that. We say we're sorry. We agree with you that it is abhorrent in your sight, a holy God, and it separates us. So, Lord, we confess it. We bring it out in the open. We don't hide it. We don't justify it. We don't sweep it under the rug. We bring it out, and we say we accept Jesus' payment on the cross in my behalf. Would you forgive me? Would you allow the shed perfect blood that he had on the cross, would you allow it to wash me white as snow? in this moment. Holy Spirit, invade my heart. You are welcome here. Would you seal me for the day of redemption? Would you redeem my body for the resurrection? Let me be part of your family. Help me to live for you, to walk with you every day forward. From this day on, Lord, we are all in. 
And we declare publicly that you are Lord. You are who you say you are. And we worship you. In Jesus' name, amen.